So how does the resistance deal with these issues? Well, I think one of the most important things that the resistance did, and I think in a kind of way, that's the message I want to give you today, I'm going to have to stop fairly soon, is to invent collaboration. What, do you, what I mean by that, how can I say the resistance invented collaboration? Some people collaborated, you may say, and some people didn't collaborate. But no, who decides what is right and what is wrong? There's no book you get out at the beginning of the occupation that says, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. One ex clear example of that is women who slept with German soldiers. Or not necessarily slept with German soldiers, but just had relationships, just even were friendly with German soldiers. In 1944, many of these women were persecuted, or tried. They, they weren't formally tried. They were about 35,000 women, like this one here, had their heads shaved by men, always by men, uh, with, and you notice how it's quite a sort of, here they're doing it, they've got two cigarettes in their mouth. Almost as they're doing it, it's like a sort of uh, normal sort of thing to do. And there's another scene of some women standing, looking, uh, well, humiliated, obviously. They've had their heads shaved. There's some much more disturbing pictures of women who've been stripped naked, who have swastikas painted on their bodies, who have their heads shaved. Now, the issue, uh, the question I'm asking, however, is, you know, who says it's wrong? Who says they did anything wrong? In fact, hands up who thinks they did anything wrong? Who thinks it is wrong? I, hands up very high. Who thinks it is wrong? to do what they did. Not what was done to them, but what they did. No one. 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 Three. Four. All men, by the way. <laughs> but I, I just make that point. But yeah, four people think it's... And I'm amazed by that, actually. I'm not, saying, I don't, I'm not saying you're right or you're wrong, by the way. I'm just saying that when I normally ask this question to a group of students, it's pretty evenly divided, actually. But my point is, there's nothing, I don't know, because it's not wrong, or it's not right. It's who, as it were, defines what is wrong and what is right. And for me, the interest and the fascination of the period is watching the French have to construct their moral maps. This is right, this is wrong. Is it, I'll ask you another question, do you consider that listening to the BBC, listening to de Gaulle on the radio, which a lot of people did in France, from, uh, he was in London, they were listening to the radio, who thinks that counts as resistance? Hands up. Hi. Or a third, roughly speaking. You really think just turning on the radio counts as resistance? Well, I think you're very generous, really. Uh, but then he or thinks fishing's okay. So, uh, so it's. Um, but, but no, the point seems to me to be, uh, and, and I think actually, yes, it does count in the sense that you could actually be arrested and indeed shot later on for listening to the radio. And at that point, you're right. Obviously, if you can be shot for it, it's clearly an act which the Germans mind and it becomes resistant. My point here, therefore, is that. There is no right or wrong answer. It's a matter of definitions. Now, I want to end there uh, I, by coming back to the present, really, to this issue I raised at the beginning about the French feeling good or bad about themselves. And I want to give you two examples to show you how these issues still matter in France today. The first. You've all heard, who is the president of France today? Hollande. And before Hollande, and before Sarkozy, Chirac. OK, let's go back to Chirac. Chirac became president in 1995. And the first act that Chirac performed as president on the 8th, 16th of July, 1995, and it was the first sort of formal thing he did. He was elected in May. They're always elected in May. And he went and he made a speech on the 16th of July. Why the 16th of July? Because that was the anniversary of the, big round, the biggest roundup of Jews that had taken place in France during the occupation. On the 16th of July, 1942, a large number, something like 15,000 Jews, are rounded up in Paris, many of them children, uh, women and children. And they were arrested by the police, 
And then they were dumped in a sports stadium uh, in the center of Paris, which no longer exists today. There's a plaque now mentioning it. It's called the Vélodrome du Vé. It doesn't exist any longer. They were dumped in this sports stadium for about, in a very hot July days, for about a week with no sanitation, no water, no food. Uh, it was, the conditions were simply horrific. Some people died, simply you know, got all kinds of really very uh, dysentery and... Um, um, uh, and, and indeed, th thirst. Old, uh, a lot of old people died, but they were then deported. The old people were immediately deported to another camp, and then ended up in Auschwitz. The children were taken to another camp in the centre of France near Orléans, and then eventually they too were deported to Auschwitz. And nobody who was arrested on that day came back. Chirac made a speech on the 16th of July. 1995, rather a long time after 1942, saying a terrible thing happened that day. And we French people must accept responsibility. Now you might say, well surely they've known about it up to that point. Of course they've known about it. But the myth previously, which every previous French president had subscribed to, was it wasn't us. It was the Germans. Yes, these 75,000 Jews died, but they died because of the Germans. Actually, we know that they were mainly arrested by the French police, but that still wasn't a problem for the French. They said, well, they were ordered to do it by the Germans. Vichy wasn't France. Where was the real France in the myth? London. The real France was London. So Vichy wasn't France. Chirac got up and said, this is nonsense. The real France, all right, there were good French in London, but there was also Vichy France, and it must bear a historic responsibility for what happened. Now, that was a very, very... Chirac, Chirac will leave no trace in history. He is the most totally insignificant president that France has ever had. But one thing will be, will be remembered for is that speech. Actually, no, there are some pretty insignificant ones in the 19th, in the 19th century, but we won't go there now. Chirac was, will always be remembered for that speech. And he did it because he wanted to sort of break this idea that, and it's partly possible for him because he was the first generation who hadn't lived through the war, of, of presidents, I mean. Then fast forward 12 years later to his successor, who somebody right like to say was Nicolas Sarkozy. And I can't, it's too early to say what Sarkozy's presidency will be remembered for, I'm not sure. But what was Sarkozy's first act as president? It was an exact, it was a, a, a kind of reply 12 years later to Chirac's first act as president. And Sarkozy went to a, a, a forest outside Paris called the Bois du Boulogne, where a large number of French resistors had been shot by the Germans. And there's a kind of clearing in the forest. And Sarkozy went there, and he organized a ceremony, and he got a schoolgirl of about 14 years old to read out, in the, all the tele television cameras were there, as they'd been for Chirac 12 years before, to read out this letter. And I'm not going to read out the whole letter, but I'm just going to read a bit of it out. And it's dated the 22nd of October, 1941, if you can see that. And it's written from Chateaubriand, which is uh, on the west coast of France. And the author of the letter was a young communist, 17 years old. And if you go to Paris, actually, there's uh, a metro stop, a tube underground stop named after him today. And he was arrested. He'd been arrested by the Germans. And Guy Moquet knew that he was going to be shot the next day. Uh, and he was indeed shot on the 23rd of October. So he wrote a letter to the, This is his last letter. And it begins, my, uh, my dear loved Maman, petite maman, my, my, my adored mother, my little adored brother, my <coughs> much loved father. And then it, it goes on, uh, je vais mourir, I am going to die. He knew that he was going to die the next day. He's 17 years old. I'm going to die. And he goes on to say, I would have liked to have, I would like to have lived. It's a very famous title. Uh, that there's many, when the, Letters of the resistance come often people quote this letter, I would like to have lived. J'aurais aimé vivre. And then he goes on to say, I would like to have lived, but at least I know I'm going to die to some purpose, that my life will have served for something. So I'm ready to die. And then 
uh, he ends uh, votre guy, your guy, he ends courage, courage, um, and uh, so your votre guy, qui, qui vous aime, guy, and he, and he dies the next day. Now, why did Chirac choose to do that? He chose to do that as a kind of implicit answer to Chirac, because he wanted to say, right, okay, we did that to the Jews, but we weren't all bad. We also, there were also, there was also this. Now, I'm not saying that the one is true about France or the other is, they're both true about France. That, ha what Chirac said happened, happened, and Guy Moquet happened. But the point I want to make is that for the French still, today, deciding what they did, what was right, what was wrong, and what it means to be French is still a massively important political uh, and moral issue.